Good afternoon, everybody. If you would do me a favor and turn your, your video on so I can at least see you for a brief period of time. There we go. I see some friendly faces. Hi, Hannah. Hi, Steve. S Sydney, pleased to meet you. Okay. Um, it's a little, what we're going to be doing, because I think there's going to be a small group of us, is we're going to have some fun with interacting. So when you want to talk, just turn your audio on and ask me a question and, and we'll answer it, okay? Now let's try to make this as interactive as we can. And um, I hope you're all doing well. I know this is kind of a weird world to be in right now. But amazingly, as a mentor at the UNM uh, main campus for the i program, um, I've got a student tomorrow who's having an, an interview with an investor through the program. Um, and I uh, had another uh, student talk for another company talk to a potential investor on Monday. And a third, a third company is getting formed right now, but it's really exciting. They're gonna be doing a hackathon online where everybody talks together and actually uh, talks about what they need to do to launch, successfully launch the product. So there's a lot uh, that people are willing to do with us online right now because that's the environment that we're in. So I do have a lot of hope for your future. And so let's get started. I'm Susan Cornelius. I am the lead mentor for uh, the i program at UNM Main Campus and have gratefully taken on the role as a mentor for the university program at UNM Valencia and had the great pleasure of working with Dr. Stephen Takich. So welcome to many of you who are here today and let's get started. When we talk about successfully designing a company, we are literally talking about, I gotta turn something else on over here. Um, no, I don't have a teleprompter. We, uh, we are talking about um, a startup, and a startup is a different thing than a large corporation. It generally starts with an idea, and most of you probably had an idea you've been talking about for a while, and somebody said, that's a great idea. But how do you successfully design a company? Now, Hannah, I know you've heard me talk about this before, but I've sort of taken a different spin on it, and Stephen, I know you've heard me talk about this before. Kara certainly has. We're going to talk about how you design a company using something exactly. called the business model canvas, okay? Um, this is what I want you to do is right now I want you to think about the answer to this following question. With the idea that you've got right now, uh -huh. how will you serve your customers? Okay, let me, I'm in the middle of a webinar. Let me put it on hold so, here. And then yeah, I'm and we can hear you. Down. Hello. Okay. <laughs> uh, and give me just a few moments and I'll call you right back. So I'd like you to think about how will you serve your customers for your idea? Would anybody like to try answering that question? Well, the darndest thing is I can't see all of you. So if you want to turn your video on, that'd be great. The question about how you're going to serve your customer has to do with what kind of meaning are you going to give your customer for your idea? For example, many, many years ago, uh, uh, a total of six, my husband and I had our last company that we worked on together. And basically we were serving the um, national laboratories by putting together devices that help their big particle accelerators perform better. And we sat in a meeting with a group of people from one of the big national labs and told them we had a device that was about this long and said, if we made an array of them inside their big particle accelerator, we could take more advantage of signal and beam. They said, not possible. And they turned around and they looked at everybody and sitting around them and said, We've had 23 people working on this for three years and it doesn't work. And we looked at them and said, well, ours does. And so we went through a whole discussion with them about how the device would provide meaning for them. They were very excited afterwards and they did work with us. So the whole purpose of asking this question is you can't design a company without asking, what meaning does your idea have to customers? And you're going to be surprised, and I, and I know some of you heard me say this before, the degree to which customers will drive what it is you're doing. Here's a second question. Have you shared, and if people could raise their, put their faces on and raise their hand, have you shared your idea for your new company with family? Anybody? Okay, guess not. Um, if you were to describe, if family were to describe what they think you're doing, what would they, what would they say? Okay, we've got some phones came on. Uh, they're not joining us with video. Um, hopefully you can still hear me. What would, your, what would your family say about what you're doing? 
Well, I had to work really hard to talk with my family about one of seven different companies that I started up myself to talk with them about what it was I was doing until I finally reached the point where they could say back to me, this is what you're doing. And wow. it was amazing that they could tell me what they, I was doing. And furthermore, they shared that information with other people and people started asking me questions about it. Um, so that is the first question we ask when we start up a company. What does it mean to your customer? And if somebody else who knew you, a friend, your family, your roommate, were to describe what it was you're doing, what would they say? Now, if you've been sharing your ideas with a roommate, a friend, or a partner, I'd like you to ask them when this workshop is over with, and what do you think I'm doing? Okay? Because it's going to help you realize whether or not you've been defining what you're doing and why and what it means to your customer. So here's a little bit about me. Um, I actually mentor companies to create uh, what I would call customer-focused companies and startups. I've done probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 477 startups. And of those 77 of them, I had a role in and seven of them were my own companies. How long a period have I done this in? Since 2000, okay? Started it into it rather later in life than what I would have wanted to do and did it in San Diego and it was a lot of fun. So when I moved back to New Mexico, um, I just went to the STC and said to Lisa Kudala, the director, how can I get involved? And now I'm doing what I'm doing with which I explained to you earlier. Um, take a look at these three questions. Are you an entrepreneurial spirit? Are you constantly thinking about how to create value and build new businesses or how to improve or transform your organization? Because you can be an entrepreneur working for the university. You can be an entrepreneur working for some kind. Hi, Brandon. Good to see you. Pipe up with questions whenever you want to. And, and are you trying to find innovative ways of doing almost everything? One of the startups that I'm working with right now is a device that sits in the middle of the solar fields and helps predict cloud cover so they can switch to another part of the grid and or buy power. He also has divide, devised a wine rack and the list is endless of the number of inventions and innovations. My husband who deals with signal in outer space um, designed a popcorn popper. People with ideas generate a lot of them. How about you, Stephen? Have you generated a lot of different ideas for things you'd like to do? Oh, definitely, Susan. And um, generally, as I do it, I try my best to think about, well, why hasn't anybody done this here? Or across my brain comes something like, well, man, I could do this so much better. And that generally generates the idea. And then as far as taking it to fruition, you know, that's where it's good to have people like you, folks like you that have done it many, many times to help guide along the way. So that's definitely happened before. Well, I have a question there on the slide. Have you done it yet? Mm -hmm. So um, I have done lots of things and many of the things have to do with either arbitrage, you know, hopefully buying low and selling high and sometimes pure arbitrage where there's limited to no risk and sometimes a little bit riskier propositions, but I've also engaged in a little bit of bricolage and again, just taking a whole bunch of things that maybe nobody wanted, you know, one man's trash is another man's treasure, but using knowledge, abilities, skills, experiences, contacts that I have to help me recombine those elements into things that are worth more than they were in their original state. So those are two things I've definitely done uh, many times and a way that I've paid for lots of my other endeavors and other projects and fun hobbies and passions that I have. So. I definitely say I've done it, but no, no LLCs and no LLPs or uh, corporations. Personally, no, not in my own name, no. Steve, you gave me the, the Stephen, you gave me this, the, the perfect lead in to what I want to say next. Um, those of you that are interested in taking the course, there's an online class that's already started called Create Cell Bank, and it's taught by Dr. Bill Zarletta, and it is totally about doing arbitrage, about buying something from somebody else and selling it over here and making some profit off of it. So if you can take a look at that, go to www.logorainforest.com. It's the only URL they've got that's .com and you'll see that there. Basically, the people that I work with as entrepreneurs are thinking of ideas 24 and seven. They wake up three o'clock in the morning, they pull out their stickies or their stickies on their phone and they get to work with their idea and then they go back to sleep. I do that myself. So let's go on to the next slide. Cecilia, there, there you go. 
frankly, the, the goal of most of these entrepreneurs that I work with, and there were 477 of them, and there's, there's a growing group that's going on right now, is they want to change the world. They don't want to study it. And I frequently have to have a conversation with them about doing some research and digging deep into the market. And we'll talk that later on. My goal is to make the road to entrepreneurship for you not easy because the path isn't easy, but certainly a lot clearer. So let's talk about, let's start talking about designing a company. Next slide. Okay, the five steps. These are them. Got to have an idea. You have to have some knowledge of who your customer might be. We're going to talk about storyboards. Um, my spare time when I have nothing else better to do, I animate things. And I create storyboards for a lot of different um, situations. Let's call it that way. And for companies. And we're going to talk about your value proposition and your business model canvas. Now, if you were thinking that we're going to get to, you know, how you raise money and all that kind of stuff, we will do that in later workshops. But you can't, and this is a tough conversation to have, unless you can present to an investor your idea, the fact that you know who your customer is, you've talked to them. A storyboard that shows the product rather simply so that the customer and the investor can understand the value proposition of it and show them a business model canvas. You literally have created a tentative business model. And so we're going to talk about that. Can you guys hear me? It's telling my, my internet connection is unstable. Okay, next slide. So a business model campus is a simple tool. And some of you, I think, got sent to you a copy of what the business uh, uh, model campus looks like. I'm going to actually pull one up here in a second. This great idea has to have value. Remember, we started the workshop with what's the value to your customer? What would you say it is, your idea? And hopefully, as we're going along, one of you will be willing to pop up and say, hey, I got an idea for this. And this is what I think the value is. Next slide. Now, this is an interesting story, and I'm going to tell you a few stories as we do this to kind of get your minds going about how do I figure out what my value proposition is. Does anybody know what that is? Well, it says right up there at the top. That's a Xerox, Xerox 914. It was launched in the early 60s, 1960s, and the gentleman down there, Chester Carlson, had already patented an idea about how you did electronic images. When the, bit, when the Xerox 914 worked out, uh, was launched, I had just graduated high school. And the first time I ever saw one, I sat there absolutely astounded. How did somebody come up with the idea about using electronic signal to create images? Well, here's the interesting part. Does anybody know what his business model was? Aha. Okay, then I'm giving you some new news. The business model was not Eventually, first, at first, they thought they were going to sell the machines, and they decided that $27,500 was a good price for the machine. But here's what they ended up doing. They ended up charging a flat rate of $95 a month, okay, for renting the machine. Anything over 10,000 copies was five cents a copy. They made a fortune. They were banking up to $28 million a month. That was their business model. It was the number of copies. Now, eventually, they changed their minds on a variety of different things, one of which was the reason that this machine weighed 650 pounds. It wasn't something you could move around. And I don't know about you, but in my office and around my house, I have various copiers that function much better than the first one I ever saw when, saw when I was a kid. 650 pounds and the business model was selling copies past 10,000. They didn't think that people were going to make any more than 10,000 copies of something or another or a group of somethings or another per month. What they found out is people were making hundreds of thousands of copies. Next slide. Now, if you look at this, this photograph carefully, you're going to see a robotic arm there on the right hand side and it's flipping hamburgers. Now, this is something new. This came out in 2017. I don't know how many of you have seen it before, but its name is Flippy. Cali Burger in, of course, California, has this robot that is fixed to the floor, and its name is Flippy. When it first came out, what do you think people had to say about it? Okay, so I, I, will, I will look at QuickBooks tonight and see if anything might have happened to it, because I've got to do some stuff for, for Ashley on um, the QuickBooks wiring. So I'll look into that, but... Uh, 
Okay, we can, we can hear you. We can hear you. I don't know who's talking. So, Flippy. Okay, I'll do it. I'll, I'll, I'll deal with it tonight. Thank you. Story behind. Bye. It. Bye. Um, Flippy has an interesting story behind it. Flippy uh, was the idea of a guy who said, you know what? People don't like working behind the grill, and I'm constantly having to, per to replace the, the get grill artists. So he talked to a company named Miso Robotics, and they came up with the idea for Flippy. Flippy can't work without the human beings being around him. So does that give you a clue of what some of the objections to Flippy was? What do you guys think some of the objections to Flippy were? What didn't people like about Flippy? Okay, you got me on that one. What they didn't like about Flippy is they thought it was gonna steal human beings jobs. What ended up happening is that's not what happening happened. Do you know who was the first person, the first company, the first group to adopt Flippy and use Flippy? And Flippy's making millions right now. And he's helping flip burgers while people talk to the customers and customize the burgers according to what they want because Flippy can't do that. He's learning because he has AI in him. But who do you think the first customer was? Well, you've heard of ESPN. You've heard of the National Football League. And you know that most football stadiums these days have a consortium of restaurants inside of them to serve fast food. Well, that's who's using them. The national restaurateurs for the National Football League are the ones who are using Flippy. So Flippy's gone from Cali Burgers in, in, La in California, basically Los Angeles, and the three other sites there, to being at almost every football stadium in the United States making hamburgers. He has AI in him and he learns over time exactly what he needs to do to make hamburgers for that particular company. Now, what do you think the business model is? How do they make money with Flippy? Well, the rent's pretty in inexpensive. It's $2,500 a month for each Flippy. What the business model is, is that they charge for software as a service because they're constantly monitoring these, these robots because they do have communications in them, monitoring these robots to see if they are learning. For instance, if a food server says he's not learning how to do rare ha hamburgers, he's stuck. Then they go in remotely and they adjust it so that Flippy can learn to do rare hamburgers for that restaurant the way they want it done. So Flippy's doing quite a, he's doing quite a good job. Let's go to the next, the next slide. So can we go to the next slide, Cecilia? Okay. So what they call the idea of Flippy is cobiotics, okay? There's over three and a half million people who work in fast food. There should be a D there. It's not fast food, okay? And restaurant AI software is really taking off. We have a company here in Albuquerque called Lavu. Lavu, at, if you've been to Applebee's or restaurants like that, where you sit down at the table and there's this little screen and you order your food off of it, and then the server comes and greets you and says, uh, it's glad to meet you. I'm going to be your server. I've got your order. It's on the line. It'll be out in five minutes or 10 minutes. That's Labu. Labu is t taking your order and how you want it customized and communicating that to the, the, the people who are in the kitchen, the chefs and the food preparers, so that it comes out the way you want. It's one of the reasons why the, hot, the uh, restaurants that are using it, the food, when they bring it out, comes ra out rather quickly and it's warm. So we've got cobiotics going on throughout the entire restaurant industry right now, but we also have AI going on. Um, the biggest barrier to market for all of this is what does a customer think of it? Some customers just don't like dealing with a screen where they've got to put their food uh, order in and doing it themselves. I think a lot of people right now are getting used to it because they're going online and ordering food it's been being picked up by Grubhub and other companies like that. But at least up until right now, people have been kind of a little bit resistant to this idea. Again, it's about $2,500 and up for maintaining the software on these devices. They'll have as many as four of them in a kitchen. And in the kitchens all over the United States for the football stadiums, you're starting to get the idea of how big this market is and that's their income per month. So business model, isn't always, I have something in my hand that I want to sell more cheaply than the next guy or is a better product that I can sell more cheaply than the next guy. 
business model is frequently sort of a two-step deal. Who's going to use it? What do they want from it? What do I have to provide? And who am I going to partner with to provide that service if I just want to be working on the machine? I don't know how many of you've had coffee out of a Nescafe maker from Nestle. It's, um, it's, it's different than some of the other uh, uh, coffee pod makers that are out there. But Nescafe built this incredible, very Italian looking espresso machine that you dropped a pod into and it makes better coffee than anybody else. Their first year, they made $30 billion. Now, granted, it was Nestle Corporation that made it, but their business model was interesting. They didn't produce, they had their name on them, but they didn't produce the coffee makers. Another manufacturer, an Italian manufacturer made it, okay, because Nestle is a European company. And what they did is they went out and contracted for the best coffee in the world, made these pods, and then put together a subscription program where people had automatically shipped to them X number of these pods per month. That's another kind of business model. It's called a segmented market. Okay? So there was somebody in that market who was making money off producing the machines, not them. They got a licensing fee because their name was on it. Where they were making was the coffee. Okay? So you're starting to think to yourself, oh, how do I do this? Well, the bottom line on all of this is personal versus personalized. Personal is when I have a family restaurant, there's no robotics involved, there's no Labu screens, and I talk to everybody personally about what they're looking for, and then the waiters in my restaurant go and talk with people, and I circle the restaurant, meeting everybody there, greeting my regular customers. Personalized is when, like Nestle, I can buy the coffee pot, but then I buy the coffee from that I want from there, and it's personalized. Amazon is the same way. I can't declare what I want Amazon to provide unless I give them some feedback. But for the most part, they're not selling through brick and mortar. They're selling through their online stores. And they're having some challenges right now because of people trying to rip people off. Um, there were some, some uh, uh, what we would call cleaning cloths that are really good for making masks. And somebody found out about it and was selling them 200 of them for $600 two days ago when I checked. So they have to work on that. You have to complain about it. But it's personalized in the sense that I can pick what I want to buy, but it's not personal service, okay? All right, so we're going to move on to the next slide. How do you get your idea formulated and how you work on, work on things without a system? You don't. People challenge ideas. They sit down and they brainstorm. And, you know, I'm, I'm guilty sitting down with a group of people. Let's brainstorm about what it is we want it, the product to be. That's great, except that I also have to have a path to get that product to market. And it's more of a, a system, and that's what the Business Model Canvas is about than anything else. Otherwise, you come out with blah, blah, blah. When I talk to startup entrepreneurs, they frequently tell me this long story about their product. But then the question is, what's your business model? How are you going to get it to market? Where are you going to make your money? You do this even with nonprofits. Um, working on a nonprofit right now, and they have to figure out how they're going to raise the money in order to pay for the products that they're giving away because they're using a freemium model. Okay, and we'll talk about more about what that means. So let's move on to the next slide. So what are all these examples of these stories that I shared with you have in common? First of all, they were all pretty darned in innovative. There were no Xerox machines. There were no pod coffee makers. And there certainly were no flippies hanging around. I like happen to like flip, flippy. I've seen flippy in action. And despite the perceived threat, they did not replace workers. They actually created more jobs. Now, what was interesting about all these companies is they, they couldn't compete in the market unless there were humans helping them out. So they had to figure out how to do customer service, and they did go to online customer service. One of the things that's unique about them that's going to be different from what we're talking about today is they didn't have a system for creating their business model and they didn't prove that they were right up front. It is absolutely, you know, I tell people, people typically say to me, oh, the market's 35 million and I'm gonna make 1% of that. And I say to them in what period of time, you're not gonna make $35 million your, your first year. That's the downside. The upside is, yes, there are companies that have made 35 million their first year. And one of them was, um, Nescafe and their coffee pods, 30 million their first year. So that's a pretty incredible story. But is that everybody? Well, 
For the rest of us, we have to kind of have a system because we don't have the resources they did because they're a big food company to launch what it was that they were doing. So uh, we're going to talk about a pathway that will help expedite you. Let's go to the next slide. Now, some of you, I know, Hannah, you've seen this before. Stephen, you certainly have. Kara, you have. Um, some, maybe some of the others of you have, uh, have seen this. This isn't a form. This is a process, and it's, I hope you can see, ooh, that looks like it's pretty small print. Um, if you've got a blank piece of paper, or it's anywhere around, and I'm, I got this methodology from Dr. Takich. Take your piece of paper and draw a great big rectangle on it all the way up to the edges, okay? Then one quarter up from the bottom, draw a line from left to right, put a line down the middle, and then make your one, two, three, four, five columns. Take the second one and take the fourth one and cut them in half because we're gonna be talking about what goes in there. Now, I am never without stickies. Today, I have them in my hand just to make the point. I don't know how many of you use stickies on your computer. I do all the time. As a matter of fact, my desktop is kind of messy. Okay, there you go. You got them too. And what you do with this is when you take the i program, we give you gargantuan business model. I mean, it's like three across and about a half feet deep. And it's got a plastic surface on it so that you can put stickies and take them on and you know, put them on and take them off. Because what you do with your first business model is gonna be based on assumptions. It's not necessarily going to be what you actually end up doing. Um, so let's start over on the right-hand side. A lot of things that we've proven that work, take our brain from the left part of our brain to the right part of our brain. So we don't start on the left. We actually start on the right, trying to get as, as creative as we possibly can. You'll see that it says customer segments, customer relations, channels and value propositions. When you pitch, and some of you are gonna be pitching by April 13th, your new idea, trying to get up to $5,000 for your idea, or is it 2,500 for first price? I think that's what it is. Um, you are gonna be talking about your value proposition, which is your product and what it does and how it makes a difference. And then customer relationships, channels, and customer segments. Let me warn you, you may have more than one value proposition. Amazon definitely does. It had an open market. They wanted to make buying more democratic. That was basically their value proposition. And then all of a sudden they realized they could do cloud servers better than anybody else. And they could charge less for them. And that small companies need, like the ones you're starting up, are gonna need cloud servers and need to rent time and space from somebody as big as Amazon, okay? So you may have more than one value proposition. In the case of Nescafe and Nestle, there were two value propositions. One was for the manufacturer of the machine and the other was for the customer who was buying it. So I just wanna to say to you, this is a very creative process that when you work together or you work with your mentor and you find out how should I do this, you begin to discover that your first version is filled with assumptions and you have to check them out with your customers and we're gonna talk about that. Um, and we're also giving you a better language to have those brainstorming sessions. Instead of saying, okay, what's our product, which is good, you have to have that. Remember, we started with the, the first step is having an idea and describing it. But unless you follow this process, you're going to be surprised what happens. Every company that I've ever worked with, and Hannah, you know that I'm right about this, has pivoted. What does pivot mean? Well, entrepreneurs like me don't speak English anyway. We speak this thing called entrepreneurship. Pivot means I started off with one idea. I think it's going to go to this market. I think this is who's going to buy it, and then all of a sudden what we're doing, once we do research, is something similar but totally different and delivered totally different, okay? Let's go to the next piece, slide. The value proposition is the most critical piece you're going to come up with. In, in the days when I was working with other angels and VCs in San Diego and in the beginning years when I was here, um, one of the first questions I asked everybody when I was talking to them is, what difference does your product make? Remember, we started today's session with talking about what would people say about your idea, okay? Um, what is the potential for your idea? That's what the value prop is all about. Now, you can use these slides as a guide. That's one of the reasons why they're laid out the way they are. So here's the questions when you do your value prop and you're do creating your pitch that you've got to answer. What are you building? For whom? What value do we deliver to the customer? Which one of our customer problems 
are we helping to solve? Has this, has, hmm, that's awkward there. Has, have we solved the problem or need for this problem for this customer? And what bundles of products and services are we offering to each customer segment? When we came up with this device that, believe it or not, they were putting together these great big particle accelerators hitting a target on the, end, on the other end for the purposes of building everything from silicone sheets for chips that go into phones to sending signal to the eyes out into the space to turn satellites on and off. But they couldn't get enough signal. They couldn't go far enough. So we came up with ideas about taking advantage not of 8% of signal, but almost 180% of signal. Actually, it was more like this, 120%. And so their signal could reach in outer space. Now, unlike the movie Ghostbusters, you can't see those kind of signals. They're not plasma signals that get everybody all goopy. But for your value prop, answering the question, what are you building for whom, and what difference does it make is what's gonna get investors interested in you. If you're putting together a nonprofit, you want people to fund you. You want them to come up with a difference. How many of you have watched those ads on TV lately about dogs and cats and adoption centers? What is it about those ads that gets you about the value of what they're doing? Why do we give them money to help the animals? Well, Americans have more animals and spend as much money on animals per year as they do on their own health care. We love animals. It doesn't make any difference whether they're snakes or horses or bunny rabbits or lizards or jellyfish in a tank. We like our pets. And so we like to take care of them. And when we see other animals suffering, we say, we got to help out in some way. We've either got to volunteer, or we've got to give them money, or we've got to give them things that they need. And when the SPCA up in Santa Fe a couple of weeks ago said, we're running out of the following things for animals and we can't get to the store to get it and volunteers are afraid to come in. What do you think happened? They showed pictures of the animals and they said, they're suffering, we need your help. And they got tons of help. The value to the customer was I felt better that I was making a difference. That was number one. Two, to a helpless creature that I understand and three, it's not going to make any difference in terms of my animals, but maybe it did. What the Santa Fe SBCA found out is after they gave their donations, a lot of people came in and fostered animals. There was something else they could make a difference while the things that are going on right now, the coronavirus, and how it has changed people's lives is going on and changing our lives. Okay? So this is your value, basis of your value prop. You've got to make a difference in people's life. What is that difference? That's your value prop. I hope that's making sense to everybody. Okay. Let's go on to the next one. And this is one I promised I would talk with you about. A storyboard. Now, when I was a kid, I lived in a little teeny tiny duplex across from another little teeny tiny duplex. And it was a lot of fun because mostly it was a community of people in Los Angeles not too far away from Crenshaw High School. If you know Los Angeles, you know that's the hood. That was where I was raised. And um, we all played out in front of our house and our parents would get together and they would talk on Wednesday nights and watch the, uh, the fights. And on Friday nights, they would watch baseball games or football games or things like that. Um, and everybody kind of got together and they talked. And one day, one of the dads said, would you guys like to come over tomorrow and learn how to, do, how to draw? Well, a bunch of us little kids raised our hands and said, we'll go. We go into their, their duplex, uh, into the living room, and there's this octopus arm. Only it's mechanical. And he presses a button, and it comes right at us, scared the living daylights up out of us. I don't think I was any older than five or six years old. What was it from? It was from a movie that had been made in the 1940s called 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Walt Disney. He was a designer, and he was a robotics designer for Disney. And he sat us down and he said, look at how I figure out what robotics I have to put into Disney movies. Because in those days, they didn't have the digital animation that they've got right now. He showed us storyboards. I was fascinated by storyboards. I also read a tremendous number of comic books. I swear, most of the ideas that I came up with for companies started with a comic book. 
So a great comic book reader. Um, my brother had the original copy of the Hulk when the Hulk was painted gray. If he knew anything about comic books, that's a big deal. That's how he rebuilt his kitchen. He sold it. So storyboard tells your, your potential investor, okay, what the problem is you think we're solving. What does the customer think the problem is? This is our product. This is how our product works. And our product does this to alleviate their problem. And it tell, tells us who interacts with the problem, okay, with the product. And what does success look like from the perspective of the user? So let's use an example that's loosely based on Mrs. Fields' cookies. Mrs. Fields' cookies, when she came up with the idea of her chocolate chip cookies, everybody said, oh my God, nobody can sell chocolate chip cookies full time and make money. They didn't know Mrs. There are cupcake artists in this country that others don't understand. So our product's gonna be a cupcake. It's a cupcake that's organic. It tastes better than anybody else's cupcake. In fact, it does. And what is the problem we think we're solving? Well, when people come into work, a lot of times they haven't eaten breakfast. And if we can provide a nutritious cupcake that actually has some protein in it, use quinoa, use a variety of different things, we think we're solving the problem of people getting hungry and of you know, Hannah or Susan or Brandon or Sydney coming into the meeting grouchy, okay? They've had something to eat. But how are we going to get fresh cupcakes to people on a daily basis? What does the customer think the problem is? They haven't had breakfast. So what is our, this is our product and how it works. They bought refrigerated turnstile vending machines, just like you see in the train station in New York. They stacked a, about 180 cupcakes inside of it. They turned over their cupcakes every two day, two days. They had to, it was organic. And people started talking about these cupcakes are delicious. Now, what were some of the barriers they had in the market? Well, if you have a town of 2,500 people, maybe you've got a central area where there's a lot of little stores and you can put one of these things in. But for the most part, these were aimed at cities like New York, like Los Angeles, like San Diego, San Francisco, Chicago, Miami, where there was a lot of people in an area. And if you've seen how the tech areas of these, these cities are put together, there's a lot of tech companies around a central plaza, and then they have food uh, companies in the middle, and they typically have machines like this. So people could go in and get these organic cupcakes that had higher protein in them. They were absolutely delicious. They weren't overly sweet, and they could buy them, and they could eat them. But how did they do what they Well, they had a rest Mrs. Fields. It was by in those cities. And then what did they do? They hired people like you to take on X number of these machines and stack the cupcakes inside. Or in Mrs. Fields' case, the cookies. They tried storefronts, it didn't work that well. They tried selling in packages for a while, Costco had them, that didn't work that well. What they ended up deciding was people wanted to see what they were buying, especially if it made them feel good. And it came out of these machines. So just like there are soda machines placed here, hither, thither, and gone, these vet, vending machines were placed in a variety of different locations. They put out these fresh cupcakes and they saw, signed a licensing agreement and a lease to people saying, this is, you gotta buy one of these machines or rent them. It's gotta look like this. It's gotta be painted in the following way. It's gotta be cleaned in the following way. And then you've got to find, and then they got put together bakers in the various cities that would produce the quality of cupcakes or cup quality cookies they were looking for. This truly was a segmented market because they were getting money off the of licensing, they were getting money off of their um, cupcake recipe. And in fact, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the fact the Coca-Cola company does not produce Coca-Cola. Every time you see a Coca-Cola plant, that plant has been built to their specifications, it's using their formula and they're making money off of the licensing and the percentage of sales, just like Mrs. Fields, just like the cupcake company, okay? So it's a different kind of business model. Hopefully this use case suggests some stories, some ideas. You could end up, depending upon what your product is, let's talk about a device, having somebody who manufactures a device and is selling it through distrib distributors and channels. Let's go on to the next slide. One of the biggest building blocks, and we said there were four that are really super important to us, We've got our idea, we're working on our value prop. We've worked on, at this point, a whole a storyboard because we wanna show that to people in our pitch. Now, pitches are interesting. You got a 90 second pitch to get people's attention when you're networking you and talking on the phone and asking 
asking them questions. You have a five minute pitch when they pull you to the side at a meeting and say, hey, talk to me about it. And then you got a 15 minute pitch slide deck that you produce that really has a lot of research behind it, talks about your market, talks about your, um, who your customers are and how you know that. Because believe it or not, investors initially are investing in you. They wanna know how knowledgeable you are whether or not you're asking the right questions and whether or not you've taken the right steps, okay? And that includes investment banks. When the investment banker talks to you, they're gonna go through all of this with you as well, okay? So customer segments. Well, we've just talked about multiple examples where the, there were more than one customer. It was actually somebody creating something of value for you with your idea, and then there was the customer. So there were two kinds of sales going on. One's called B to B. So it's a letter B to B. That means business to business. And that was the, the uh, uh, Xerox copier. That was the coffee, cup, the coffee pot. And that was our vending machine and the services for getting the cupcakes to them. Okay. And then, oh, Flippy. Flippy. That's another example. Somebody put Flippy in place, but then you were paying a lease amount per month for the services of software. So because we exist for the customer. We need to find out what our customers want. And you can see there's a bunch of Google up on here about mass market, niche market, segmented market, diversified market, and multi-sided platforms. Multi-sided platforms are really kind of interesting. That all the big banks and all the companies that have got banks like GE, they have two major customers with different needs. Vendors who are running the, the banking stations and the customers themselves. This has become critical in our world. How many of you use an online banking app? How many of you have gotten a, a loan from an online bank? Okay. Those banks are on the back end using somebody like Wells Fargo or Bank of America. They've got a software platform where they ask you all kinds of questions. So their platform, as customers, they've got banks and they've got the lenders. They've got two different people that they have to make sure they're pleasing and supporting at all times. I love those online bank platforms. Uh, I can't recommend one to you, but I like them because I think they're very clever. They take advantage of today's market and where are they making their money? They are getting a percentage when they um, uh, put together a loan package, get it uh, financially, when they get it successfully financed and you are, use that to buy your house, your car, your motorcycle or start up your business, okay? Um, one of the things that we don't worry about as much in that world anymore is location because the location is a cloud. Okay. But in the case of that cupcake business, we had to worry about location. Did we have to worry about location for Amazon to a certain degree? We did in order to personalize service. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Dallas, but in Dallas, Texas is one of their biggest distribution centers. It's right next to the airport. I kid you not seven to 10 miles of warehouses. Some of them are labeled blue with the big smile on it with the arrow and that's prime. And the others are the other um, Amazon warehouses. There's blue trucks, blue and brown trucks in front of the prime and there's the regular Amazon trucks in front of the others. And those warehouses have got robotics in them. The robots follow the people around carrying their stuff so the people don't have to carry it and get it online. It's why they can now promise they'll get something to you in two days. And they have a very, very multi-sided platform right now. And location's important because they're right next to an airport. Um, what the, one of the things that's kind of interesting about location and employees is I'm very fascinated by pop-up stores and online pop-up stores to get people's attention about your product and find out what they think of it. So as we're moving through this and you're getting ideas, start writing them on stickies or use electronic stickies on the computer that's in front next to you. Most, a lot of us have got two computers in one spot. Um, did you know, do you guys know what city has the most small businesses of any big city in the United States? Anybody got a wild idea? I used it in a previous conversation, San Diego. If you look at the uh, National Chamber of Commerce site, they have over 6,500 small companies. VCs coming out of there, venture capitalists coming out of their ears, angel investors coming out of their ears, and deals going on. Now, I will warn you about deals right now. I don't know what they look like, none of us do, but just before all of this started happening, 
the deals were bigger. They were more money than we had ever seen before. Uh, and they weren't making as many of them, but the, the, the money was climbing as to what the deals were and what they were looking for. Investment banks were interested in deals. Angels are in interested in deals. And these online banking services are interested in deals. So don't be telling yourself right now, I can't do this. Um, those of you who have an is existing business, I will s share with you, if you're having some problems with it, the CARE Act right now that was just passed by Congress does have information in it about how you can go about getting loans and money to keep your business alive while people are uh, keeping in their personal space, okay? Uh, so do look up CARES Act. But I am fascinated with the whole idea of online and pop-up shops. Um, let's go to the next slide. One of the most building, important building blocks in putting your company together is customer interviews. Now we're talking about the process of the business model canvas. It looks like a form, but it's a process that gets us to where we want to go. This is going to be the key component to your success. An investor or somebody who's interested in you and wants to support you in some way wants to know who you've talked to, who has said to you, not only is that a great idea, but I would buy it at this price, and these are the features I'm looking for. It is the beginning of your success. Now, people say, how do I call up people? One of my favorite students going through this program, and everybody's my favorite student, I tell them all that, was a young man by the name of uh, Mustafa Peselkan. Mustafa is from um, Singapore. Well, he's from a variety of different places, Iran actually. And he's a graduate student here at the University of New Mexico. His idea was doping uh, fiber uh, cables to keep continuous communications across the world. This is how the cloud communicates on one level, also through satellites. And it was so doggone innovative. Um, you know how he got people to talk to him? He wrote out 100 letters on LinkedIn. This is not supposed to work. It's working right now, though. Not supposed to work. And he got 60 responses. He knocked it out of the park with people telling him, this is what you need to do so that we can use this product, who you're going to sell to, who wants it, what difference is it going to make. They were telling him. And CEOs of companies were writing him back notes on LinkedIn. So what does he do right now? He has an idea for a ventilator. Very easy to build. It's not going to cost him any more than $50. And he thought if he could get some money, well, couldn't he start building them? Couldn't he start a nonprofit? Called me up a week ago last Sunday. We talked about it. He wrote a letter to a favorite VC, favorite VC that I know of mine up in uh, Boulder, Colorado. And sure enough, he got an email back, said, we don't even have to talk about it. I know I know who your mentor is. I know what you're doing. I am trying to fund as many of these as I possibly can in various states. And he funded him. So business is being done right now. And everything is being wiped away from the rules about how we typically do things, except you have to know this stuff. You have to know who your customer is, why this is going to be important. In the case of his ventilator, he's thinking of it for uh, developing companies, marginalized populations, where out there they can't get hands on the great big $60,000 ventilators, okay? So one of the things I want to talk about for your interviews, again, if you have a piece of paper, and just I'm trying to give you formats for things, take it and turn it so that it's this way, and draw a line down the middle, and then draw a line down the middle this way, and I'm going to be talking about the quarters. This first quarter down here is A, B, C, and D, if you can visualize that. So there really is a format to talking to customers. In, in block B A, you're going to write down a, an introduction, how you're going to introduce yourself and your goals. In block B, you're going to introduce your product to the, the, the uh, potential customer who could possibly become an investor. And you're going to show them your storyboard. Now, you're not showing them how it works. You're not going into the AI, how that was programmed any of that stuff, you're just showing them how it works, how the customer would use it, and what his features are. You use the storyboard to do that. In block C, you ask them questions about what they think. Did it have the features you were looking for? Did I get the services right? How would you use this? How, where are you getting stuff from right now? What are you using instead of what I'm offering? And is it working for you? Was it costing for you? And what's it costing for you? And they're going to ask you, the customer's going to ask you, well, how much does your cost? And you're going to need to know the cost, okay? 
So you plan out your questions. A, you're introducing yourself. B, you're showing the, the, what you're doing in the storyboard and then the customer can ask you questions about it. C, you're asking the customer questions. And one of the things I tell to everybody in, in C, part C, is do your pitch and tell them, look, I've got a pitch for what I'm doing. I'd like your feedback on it. Does it make sense to you? People, CEOs of com big companies are gonna tell you, oh my gosh, this is what I think, all right? And then summarize what you've heard. That's, that's D. So down on the, the bottom quart, quadrant on the left-hand side, in D, summarize. Ask them, did I get it right what I heard you say? And they'll tell you, no, you missed this, or this is actually how I would word it. You thank them for their time. You ask if you can stay in touch, and then you ask the most important question you will learn as an entrepreneur. Is there anybody else I should be talking to? Are there two people? I should be talking to. Most important thing in the world. So let's summarize, ask for the meeting, introduce yourself, tell them about your goals. B, show them your storyboard, let them ask questions about it. C, tell them, I'd like to ask you some questions, would that be okay? And then you ask them about your features and what you've done and what do they think of it and what, what's missing and tell them your pitch and see what they think. And then D, you ask them if you can stay in touch and is there anybody else I should be talking to? The most important question, if you do a 90 second pitch at a networking event at Fat Pipe and somebody really likes your story but you don't think it's gonna go anywhere, you say to them, are there another two people I ought to be talking to? I call those face-to-faces. And after you get really good at it, it won't even bother you that you've done it. And it won't bother them either, they're used to it. People who go to those events, who are coming up with ideas, who are entrepreneurs themselves, or are looking for something to fund, they're used to be being asked that, okay? The basic word here is you have to proceed with these customer interviews. Next slide, key building blocks, channels. And we're, only, we're not gonna go through all of this because we are at uh, 224, but I wanna kind of mention each one of them. Channels, who do you need to work with to get either existing parts or innovative parts built in order to be able to do what you're doing? So the cupcake company, they had to figure out how to put to get together, based on current technologies, a refrigerated vending machine, but they wanted it to be seen from 360 degrees. And they wanted it to be white with pink on it, really attractive, sparkly lights, so that people would notice it, okay? Can someone else bake better than you can? And they discovered that people could bake really well given their recipe. Interesting, some people haven't done that. Do you know that Starbucks owns all its stores? It doesn't allow anybody else to build their stores other than per their specs. The employees inside of them are their employees and the coffee is their brew. They own every single solitary Starbucks in the world, okay? And, oh, they have a company by the name of Profit Line. A girlfriend of mine started that company up. That um, when you've got, when you own that many companies, thousands of them, locations, thousands of locations, you have to be able to do the books for those companies. And they put together uh, a software for the back end of Starbucks that is their main bread and butter, so to speak, that um, is their Starbucks version of QuickBooks only for all the Starbucks stores because it's got everything built into it. And it's called Profit Line. Personal versus personalized. Let's go to the next particular slide. If this is an interesting question, you can go to Whole Foods and pick out what you need, which is personal, or you can go online and find only what they have to offer right now. Same thing with Costco, same thing with Smith's, same thing with Target or Walmart, just about any big box store. And you can ask for substitutions, but you don't get to make those decisions. Do people really want to have that kind of relationship? Some people do. That's how they're protecting themselves right now. Others don't like it. They want to feel it. They want to touch it. They're willing to take the risk. The thing is, you have to decide the degree to which you're going to be involved with your customers and figure out your customer relationships. And once you've done those interviews, you want to keep in touch with them. Send them a note once a month, email. Oh, and there's one thing I will say that still works in this world, and that's a handwritten note after the customer interview and sending it to them in the mail. 
They love it. Um, protection one is kind of interesting in this regard with customer relationships. Most, they, they, they are really arbitrage. They're buying all their components from everybody else. What their special sauce is, is their technicians who come into your home and install the system. As a matter of fact, they don't have any sales personnel. It's their technicians who are their sales personnel. They're the ones that send, sell you the better system to do this, that, or the other thing once they walk into your home, your apartment, or your business. Because they're selling control systems from Hewlett Packard, and they're selling sensor devices from other companies, and they have a wide range of companies they work with to sell sensors, okay? They're installers, they're technicians, those are their sales teams. Building blocks. Boy, next slide, building blocks. This one impacts everything. Um, you have to figure out what your service, your device, your cupcakes, your sensing system, whatever it is that you're doing is going to cost. You want to know what the, the customer is currently using and how you make money from each segment of your market. What does your customer pay? That's the questions you're going to ask in part C of your build to the customer interview and how would they prefer to pay. Um, Xerox, they found out their customers were willing to pay $2,500 minimum per month at a time when $2,500 was a humongous amount of money. It didn't even cost $2,500 a year to go to college. So $2,500 a month was a huge amount of money and it built them a huge business. It's this part where you, you have to really do research. Um, let's say you're working on a application that makes it easy for people to open and close everything in their house, all their devices, their ovens, everything else. And you're going to be putting red light sensors on them and you're going to have an app on your phone and I can turn on my oven and it's warmed up when I come home and I throw my frozen pizza in it. So, and by the way, these things exist. What are willing people willing to pay for that per month on their phone? What are your competitors offering? What does their cost? And what do you like about yours? Hmm. Maybe there's a camera that can be set up in the kitchen that sees the front of the oven. You can see that it's actually turned on and you're not coming home to mush put pizza. Okay. It is everybody that I've talked to here in New Mexico that is in the art community is making candles. And they tell me, but my candles are better. I need to know what the ingredients are, how much it's going to cost, why are they better, and that's my dog. Oh, Sherman, hello. We call him the Shermanator. He's a great big Labrador retriever. How do your competitors earn money? You'd be surprised if you are on LinkedIn, which you should be. I don't love LinkedIn. I don't use it for anything else other than customer research. But I was trying to look and see what a company was doing and I could see all these people that I was loosely connected to. I got linked to them and I called them up and I said, look, this is what I'm working on. And that was one of the very first companies I ever worked on. What was that company? Well, that company was called Interview, video streaming via the World Wide Web. It sold for three and a half billion dollars in 2000. I didn't own it. Brian Kenner and Harry Gruber did, but I was their business development person. And that's how I found out what people were doing to get information. And that's how we built a market for this thing we're using right now, Zoom, which is a video streaming via the World Wide Web. And what were people willing to pay for it? They wanted it for it at a, a, a subscription fee, but then they wanted a software that built the videos. We had multiple platforms that we built, multiple platforms, okay? Next one, key resources. We're gonna stop on this one and I'm gonna kind of walk you through the last ones and I want you to read them. Um, your key resources. What do you need? And that's on the business. Now we move to the left-hand side of the Toronto campus. What do you need to, to, in order to launch your company? Intellectual property, patents, customer lists, great people, marketing, sales, and managing services. I'm going to talk about great people for, for a minute. When you start figuring out the kinds of people you need to be working with, you need to figure out what kind of skills they've got to have. When you start off, it could be you and your roommate. It could be you and your uh, uh, partner. It could be you and a member of your family, okay? And in order to get that company to launch, you've got to have some key people. Now you can go to QuickBooks and you can do taxes on TurboTax. You can do, find all kinds of software plat platforms to take care of most of the business activities you need to do. But that creative spark, 
you've got to ask yourself, if the person I'm hiring exactly like me, I would challenge you, and a friend of mine by the name of Gary Kawasaki, employee number three of Apple, they called him the chief enlightenment officer, would say the same thing, and he was my mentor. You have to find people who are different from you. You have to disagree. That is the way you're going to launch a successful company. Now, you're going to fight all the time. Hopefully, you're using the business model campus, Canvas, and you're not. The last slide I'm going to talk about a little bit is building blocks, key activities. One of the weaknesses is we don't do a plan for how it is we're going to do what we're going to do. And I like to think of launching your company in terms of phase one, phase two, and phase three. So we've got three phases that we go to to build the company. In phase one, we have to worry about the product development and a prototype. We have to worry about who our partners are going to be. All those things I just went over. Who is going to distrib distribute it for us, our key channels? How are we going to make money? How are, what do our customers need, really? Customer development, patents and trademarks, and are we, what kind of social media and websites are we going to use? In phase two, we have to figure out what version of all those things we're going to have ready. Are we going to have a website? Are we going to have an app on a phone? How are people going to contact us? Do we have our patents and trademarks in phase two? What do we need now? So phase one is got to have it now. And one of the biggest things is money. People use all kinds of platforms to get money. They get their pitches ready. They do their 15 slide uh, pitch deck, pitch slide deck. I can't say that one fast. Um, and they go out and they start talking to people who've asked for a second conversation. Is that happening? Like I said, tomorrow, one of the startup companies that I'm working with at, the, at UNM is having that first conversation. So phase one, phase two, phase three, in phase three, and these things could be really short. Phase one is three months, okay? Phase two could be six months. and phase three, you're at nine months. Most initial investors in your company want to see you've got something ready to go at, in nine months. It's like birth and a baby. It's your company, your baby. You've decided what it's selling. You've talked to your customers and verified it. You now know what you need. You're really needing that initial investment. So how are you going from phase one to phase three, how are you getting people to invest in you? John Chavez, who's the chair of New Mexico Tech Angels says one thing, I'm investing in you. I wanna know about you. I want you to be able to talk about yourself. I wanna know why you did this. I wanna know why you're passionate about it. I wanna know what steps you've taken. And if you've got a prototype, ooh, that's important. Does it have to be beautiful? No, but if you've got a prototype and you've done, done some research on the market, you know where you stand, I don't care how old you are, how you got started or what you're selling, I'm gonna get interested in you. That's what he says, okay? The rest of this, and I would like you to look at them, and if you've got any questions, feel free to contact me. Um, talk about what key partners you're gonna need. Can we go to that real quickly? And I think we're gonna have this launched up on the website tomorrow, so you'll be able to get the complete copy of all of this, okay? Um, who's distributing for you? What kind of relationships are you gonna have with your customers? Keep in mind, Nescafe wanted everybody coming back to them once a month. Starbucks wanted people to go and buy a cup of coffee from them every single solitary morning. We spend a lot of money on coffee. They were right. Who's going to do your production and manufacturing, your problem solving? Who's going to have a product development team? One of the best teams that I ever worked with was a company that launched the very first online digital electronic health record. They were located in San Diego. Their entire office was taken up by their production product development team. And they had this incredible environment with stickies all over the walls, computers lining the desks, and they would talk with one another all day long, depending upon what part of the code they were working on. And they would show each other code, but they also took photographs on their smartphones and sent them from person to person saying, this is what the line of code look looks like. And we captured that online for them through a company called Learning Framework. So key partners, who are you gonna be working with? Cost structure, that's our next one. Um, cost structure. The most important costs inherent in our business model, typically people think it's their prototype. They're surprised to find out that it's not. But cost is all the key resources you put in. Everything we've just talked about that you've got to plan for, what is that gonna cost? Investors expect you to burn through some money your first nine months. At the end of the year, they want to see products out in the market. 
look at the market. If you're selling to other businesses, how are they doing that right now? Don't just predict you're going to make 1% of the market. Your cost structure, how much you're charging for whatever it is you're doing, your product or your service is based on this in-depth research. And I happen to believe that startup companies can do this. They don't have to hire real expensive marketing people. All of you can do this yourself. So the last thing down here on your cost structure, next slide, is ask about this during the customer interview. Ask what they're willing to pay for what it is you've got, or what are they currently paying, or you may have a product nobody's ever thought of before. What would they be willing to pay for it? Next slide. The next slide, the business canvas is quite simply a tool. You can see that it's a process. We work through things and we build stuff. And the first right-hand side of it is the piece you're gonna put in your pitch. The left-hand side of it is all about the money and the resources and how we're gonna get it done. And down at the bottom, we've got your stuff about your cost and your revenues that we build. Next steps, I would ask you, next slide. Yeah, we're there. I would ask you to take this process and sit down, okay, with people and talk to them about how this business model canvas. Just put it in the middle of the table, grab a bunch of stickies, do it out loud, do what I would call a hackathon. One of the companies I'm working with this semester is doing a hackathon. They're designing a software. They're bringing in people who would use it, people who would buy it for somebody who would use it. They're bringing in grandparents, parents, they're bringing in all kinds of family and they're gonna sit down for four hours and they're gonna say, what's the value? What should this do? How much should it cost? On and on and on. And they're using a minimum amount of money to bring some food into the room and they're gonna sit there captured for four hours and the guy whose idea it is is gonna facilitate the meeting. Last slide there, books. And I'm sorry I took longer than I thought I was gonna take, but that's just me. Um, these are three of my favorite books. If I really wanted to read anything first, I would read The Art of the Start by Guy Kawasaki. Really, really easy to read. It's like having a conversation with the dude. Yeah, hey, Stephen. <laughs> it's like having a conversation with the dude. I mean, it's just really easy to talk. The very first time I talked to him about a question, he was going down a ski hill and I was on the phone in another state, okay? The business model generation, a little bit eggheaded, but if you want information about what I've just given you, I've given you a guide. It asks all the right questions, just answer the questions. And then the last one is a friend of mine. Um, if you've ever heard about Eric Ries, the Lean Entrepreneur Movement, um, Brant Cooper and Brad Feld up in Boulder, Colorado, the three of them are absolutely amazing. Uh, they built a bazillion companies and Brad was the investor in that company I was telling you about where he wrote a letter and asked for the money and now he's helping them out. Um, the Lean Entrepreneur literally gets into how you do customer interviews. It's got a lot of drawings in it. He's got a new book coming out. Uh, it has to do with the value prop. I don't make any money off of this. I just happen to like these three guys and the way they think. Go to YouTube and look up Alexander Ostevalder. He is from Sweden. He has a company called Strategizer. Speaks absolutely immaculate English. And he has, there's a lot of, if you're wondering about any of the things that I've talked with you about, you'll find uh, YouTube videos on this. They're, they're long-ish. They're about 11 to 20 minutes, each one of them. But it'll go, once you've had a chance to think about this, you've taken a look at the guide when it comes out tomorrow, go and take a look at some of his YouTube videos, okay? My name is Susan Cornelius, and I don't know, if you wanna hang in here with me and ask some questions, I've gotta be done at three o'clock. I have a meeting with one of the companies that I'm coaching. But if you've got any questions, blurt them out now. So thank you very much to you. Um, Cecilia, Cecilia, is it the 15th that we're doing um, online? Coaching sessions for 30 minutes each? Yeah, so the next um, session will be on April 15th at 10 a.m. There will be like a 15-minute um, quick seminar with 15-minute question and answer. And then there's um, mentoring sessions that you can sign up for afterwards. They're 30-minute slots, and it's all via Zoom. Okay. So the 15th, we're starting at 10 a.m. with a 15-minute boot camp. I do manage to talk in 15 minutes for that. And then we have half hour sessions that you can sign up for. Go to loborainforest.com. Again, it's the only part of their site that's got .com on it. And you can sign up for a 30 minute session and we'll talk just like we were doing today on Zoom. And you're gonna to get to ask all your questions about your business model canvas that you're working on. 
So, and you can also um, use LinkedIn to send me questions and ask me about stuff, okay? Thank you very much. I appreciate you giving me some of your time and I wish you nothing but success. Stay safe, stay healthy, okay? Thank you, Susan.